I'm Luke Story. For the past 22 years, I've been relentlessly committed to my deepest passion, designing the ultimate lifestyle based on the most powerful principles of spirituality, health, psychology, and personal development. The Lifestylist Podcast is a show dedicated to sharing my discoveries and the experts behind them with you. I'm so excited to talk to you. I've been devouring your book, which I've been aware of for many years, and I've, I finally sat down and did my best to read it, which is like, I mean, I know you approached it from a scientist's point of view to make it accessible, and, it, and I think you achieved that, but I'm, it's still, I'm like really having to read it slowly. So Jerry, you seem to be quite an out-of-the-box scientist, a challenger of sorts. I'm wondering when you first realized that you wanted to sort of stretch the limits of the traditional paradigm of science? Well, it's not that I wanted to. Um, it's that I felt obliged to. And um, it all started, it started when I was a, a, a graduate student at the University of Pennsylvania. And I, my former field was muscle contraction, the molecular mechanism of contraction. And uh, as a graduate student, I was building some uh, models, uh, computer models of of, um, of of cardiac muscle and how the muscle worked. And um, I didn't quite finish. I had been a graduate student for quite a few years. My advisor enjoyed my presence, I guess, and kept me going. And finally, it was time to finish. And a Japanese guy came along uh, it, um, who would, uh, in, in theory, finish my project, uh, go on. And he told me, um, this is very uh, un uncharacteristically uh, Japanese. Uh, Japanese tend to be modest. He said, I can't do it because the theory on which you base your model is completely wrong. I, I said to him, well, wait a second. How, how, what are you talking about? This theory was put forth by a Nobel laureate um, and um, not just a Nobel laureate, but a Nobel laureate among Nobel laureates. This guy, his name was, he passed uh, recently, Sir Andrew Huxley. And he was a member of the Huxley family, you know, uh, uh, Thomas Henry Huxley, Aldous Huxley, except that he won a Nobel Prize. He was the only one of the family to have, have done that. And, and then after winning a Nobel Prize and for a different different field, he came came forth with a, um, a theoretical model of how muscles contract. And that model persists to, to this day. However, my Japanese friend told me it's impossible. He said, if it really worked the way Huxley suggested it worked, uh, the muscle would fall apart after the first contraction. It, it was unstable. And uh, it was my first inclination of uh, the idea of stability and instability. Everything needs to be stable. Otherwise, you know, it, <laughs> it falls apart quickly. Well, within five minutes, he had me convinced that uh, this was correct. And, you know, then I came to realize that, that just because the uh, purveyor of, of some mechanism happens to be a distinguished a scientist, distinguished member of a distinguished family, so to speak, doesn't mean he's right. Uh, you know, we all pee in the same pot, uh, so to speak. We eat the same food. Uh, you know, we may sleep on the same mattress. We 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 all make love and et cetera, et cetera. So so um, the, you know, uh, a human being is is fallible. And then, uh, so so it was that experience that um, led me. And by the way, the objection that this Japanese guy came up with, his name was Iwazumi, uh, it, it persists to this day. It's not, it's not the only objection uh, to this theory. There are many, many other factors, you know, which leads into a, a, a different discussion. And that's not what you asked, just that life is difficult for people who challenge uh, the, uh, the, the prevailing view. Anybody else in in the field, it's easier for them to follow the leader, so to speak, to follow the great Nobel laureate than to follow somebody who is challenging the view, no matter how cogent the challenge might, might be. It is not new. It's, it, it, it's well known as an uphill battle. So anyway, 
um, I gave you a long answer to a short question. This was my first exposure um, to the idea uh, that, that, that just because something is in the textbook doesn't mean it's right. Right. Yeah, definitely understood. And I, I sense from reading your book, The Fourth Phase of Water, which I have here for those watching on video, um, that your approach to science, to me, represents a more valid approach than the approach that says, um, we don't think that this hypothesis is possible, therefore it's not possible. Which <laughs> <You know? Yeah. laughs> is just... Oh. A, we, Boy, have I have I have I seen that yeah. uh, n- numerous times? Uh, you know, we don't think it's possible, therefore it's not possible. And you know, and 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 people grasp. People in the field tend to uh, grasp onto uh, uh, that. It's it's hard. It's hard for most people um, to to think about a change of paradigm. Uh, you know, they they grew up with a certain way of thinking and they it's most convenient and natural to persist in thinking oh yeah well what i learned in fifth grade is right um it's um fact of life that one one needs to contend with so yeah, change change of mind is is uncomfortable i guess we get we get stuck in certain structures and then if those structures of belief get threatened then if one's so identified with them, then I suppose we as a as a person feel threatened because we're so closely identified to that belief that it's like a well, loss yeah. of self, you know? Yeah, loss of self is 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 a, a good way to put it. It's a real challenge. But you know, that is the purpose of science. Um uh, after all, it's not to it's not to um to 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 acknowledge that what they learned is correct. It's it's to find new new information and new interpretations and 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 explanations for phenomena that seem to exist that uh, you know when when multiple p- people confirm a certain observation, the tendency is to uh, if it doesn't fit with the current thinking to basically you know sweep it under the carpet and and let somebody else in the future deal with it, but stick doggedly. Um, to to the the conventional explanation, it feels comfortable for most to do that. So science uh, involves, unfortunately, I guess discomfort because it involves revolutions, and revolutions are not comfortable. But that's that's the way we 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 proceed. So when I uh, when I look at a, a textbook and and read something. I've gotten to the point, you know, having done science for many years, where my first reaction is, well, you know, if it's simple, nature operates, I think, simply. It's a principle uh, based on so-called Occam's razor that's been around for uh, countless generations. I think Sir William of Occam was a uh, 14th century, I think, or something like this, and then Newton um, decided that. Um, his his approach, Auckland's approach, which was mainly a religious approach uh, to the existence of God. You know, you have two two hypotheses: one, God exists, and the other is God doesn't exist. And and the likely uh, truth is the simpler of the two paradigms. Um, and then Newton <laughs> thought this is pretty interesting, and and suggested that the same principle applied to science. Uh, you know, um, it, it, science should be simple. Um, and Einstein amended that. Uh, he said it should be simple, but, um, you know, n- as simple as possible. Um, uh, so his, his, his view is a bit more complicated uh, than, than Newton and, Occam and Occam's razor. But, but for me, when I read something, it, if it has uh, the, the sense of simplicity, it, it 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 has a ring of truth to it. You know, if if A yields B, leads to B, which leads to C, which leads to D, it looks good. But on the other hand, most of what you read in the textbook is not like that. Um, it's complicated. And and when it's complicated, for, for me anyway, it raises a question of whether it's true. And 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 those are the aspects that intrigue me and 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 draw me in, in into thinking about about the possibility of simpler paradigms that um, could make more sense. So 
I, I admit to that um, predilection. Um, <laughs> I'm looking for simplicity. Maybe I've got a simple brain and I can't, I can't comprehend um, ideas that are too complicated. So <laughs> there we are. <laughs> well, let's apply some of what you learned in terms of water. Uh, I find it fascinating that two thirds of the earth is covered with water and that on a molecular basis, 99% of our body is water, yet we seem to understand it so little. <laughs> you, uh, over the, over well, the years of, of the research that you focused on water, why do, you, why do you think that it's so discounted in terms of humanity's desire to really understand it, specifically from a scientific point of view? Good question. Um, um, I, I think um, long ago, water was a, a genuine uh, area of interest in science. Now it's not, and uh, except that it's, there's beginning to be a resurgence. Um, and why is it not? And I think the, the answer to why it's not um, has to do with two debacles that took place in water research. Um, two incidents that happened over uh, the past uh, well, I guess now 60 or 70 years that had a huge, huge impact on scientific uh, discourse and, and society. Uh, two ultra prominent scientists who um, got discounted uh, very rapidly because they found something about water that, that seemed strange. And, you know, to me these days, they don't seem strange at all because they've been essentially corroborated and uh, I'll just tell you briefly about about the two. And if I if I run on too much, please stop me because these are such interesting stories that had a really deadening impact on research in water. It, it, it sort of stopped. And, and the first one was I was a guy, a Russian guy. Um, his name was Boris Deryagin, and and Deryagin was the premier physical chemist in all of Russia. And he began to publish his stuff, and it was mostly in in, in Russian. But then, um, it was in the 1950s, I think, or early 60s, uh, uh, late 50s, that a lot of stuff began to be translated. And and once it got translated into English, uh, uh, people began to be uh, interested, especially work coming from so distinguished a scientist as Boris Deryagin. So Deryagin published some. Uh, work about some weird properties of of water, and um, and 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 those properties um, then aroused the interest of uh, of scientists, and and there was something weird about it. Uh, the the there was he identified a, a kind of water that's different from ordinary liquid water. Uh, the the um, vaporization uh, temperature was higher than ordinary liquid water. The freezing temperature was lower. The density was different. Uh, a host of different properties of this kind of water uh, differed. And when it finally got to the West uh, after the translation, this was the time of the Cold War. Uh, we 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 grew up uh, learning that the Russians were idiots, uh, you know, and. And and they grew up with similar propaganda about us, so so the the, the there was a you know a, a, a kind of mentality uh, to 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 show that that the others are simply insane, you know. And so when people started looking at Deryakin's work, uh, the the thought was, this is nonsense. This can't be. How is it possible that there's a different kind of water? It doesn't make any sense at all. Um, and and they were, and, and Deryagin was was challenged. Um, and and um, the Western scientists were thinking, and remember now there's a competition between the West and, and the East at the time of the Cold War. And it was argued that there was some kind of contamination, that this really wasn't just water. It was some kind of contaminated water that the Russians were dealing with. And, 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 and that, of course, aroused, aroused suspicion that the Russians may be dead wrong, that there is no other kind of water than, than, um, than this liquid. But, but um, and, and the nails in, in the coffin 
um, came came from I think from an Australian group, and and what they did is um, they put some salt in the water, and once they put the salt in the water and made various measurements, uh, they were able to um, in, infer that the Russians must have had salt in their water. They must have been sweating in their water during summer experiments or lack of air conditioning <laughs> or something, you know. And that was that was sort of and the Russians, the Russian government, what. What's not known um, widely and what I know, um, having spoken to people who are intimate with, with, with this guy, with Boris Deryagin, and I spoke to two such people and they told me the same story. Um, and, 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 uh, and therefore, I, I think it's probably true, is that the Russian guy, the Soviet government approached uh, Deryagin and they said, this is really embarrassing for Russian scientists. And, you know, if you want to keep your job and not be sent off somewhere to some work camp in, in Siberia, you better retract. And so he retracted. And his retraction, you know, once he retracted, everybody thought, well, it, it's it's all over. There's no no such thing as what began to be called poly water because the water seemed to behave more like a polymer rather than a collection of individual molecules. So poly water was a, a debacle and, and people it had a serious impact on science because the scientists then um, kind of thought that, oh my goodness, if, if the most prominent scientist in, in all of Russia, and there were a lot of physical chemists, uh, the most prominent physical chemists, they had a lot of them, uh, he was the if he can screw up so badly by by having contamination in his preparation. What about mere mortals like us? So it had a really deadening effect. And I remember when I was a graduate student, uh, I remember a professor coming to me, and and my department was actually uh, surprisingly there were people interested in studying water at the time in a, a a different way from the way we and others had, had studied it. And he came to me and he said, you know, when you graduate, you can do anything you want, but don't involve yourself in the field of water. <laughs> and I remember it because it was so, you know, it's too dangerous. You put your, dip your toe into water <laughs> and you, your toe might freeze or something like this. So stay away from water. So that was, that was the first debacle. And a lot of scientists stayed away from researching water because you know, they were nervous. They wanted to, their careers. And then one that's maybe even more famous uh, uh, came along, and, and this was uh, Jacques Benveniste. And perhaps you have, have heard the name or know about uh, Jacques Benveniste. And Jacques, Jacques was actually a friend of mine, and I, um, he passed uh, about 15 years ago. And he found something weird. So something, someone, he had been, he was an immunologist and he was a famous immunologist, a high level scientist with 50 people or so working in his laboratory in Paris. And he was working uh, with a, a, a biological preparation where he would put some antibodies on a particular kind of cell. He'd, uh, he'd expose the cells to these antibodies and the cells would secrete, I think it was, they would secrete histamine. And someone came to his lab and said, you know, I can achieve the same result that you achieve, even if I take these antibodies and dilute them and dilute them and dilute them to the point where uh, there's nothing left but water, but water that had been exposed previously to the antibodies. I mean, the same, same result. And of course, um, Jacques was skeptical. He said, oh, okay, you know, there's a corner of my laboratory there and nobody, it's, it's not in use, show us. And, and pretty, pretty soon all 50 people in the lab were hovering around him because he could demonstrate indeed that um, he could dilute and the same way that homeopaths do, um, dilute and shake and dilute and shake and, and so on. And, and indeed he showed the same result. And, uh, and so it appeared that Somehow, the the water molecules had information um, derived from the the uh, antibodies or the molecules with which uh, the water had contact previously, implying some kind of water memory, water information. Otherwise, how could this happen? Well, 
So he, uh, he was impressed. They did more experiments. They submitted their results to the journal Nature. And, and the response from Sir John Maddox, who, um, um, the late Sir John Maddox, who was the editor-in-chief of, um, of Nature, he said, and you can find this in many places on the internet, basically the letter said, um, we, um, uh, you can't, we won't, we won't consider this even for to send out for review because you can't be right. Because if you're right, everybody else is wrong. And I, <laughs> as editor, uh, refuse to believe that everybody else is wrong. Therefore, forget it. <laughs> so if you, if you received a, a rejection letter like that, I'm not sure what you would do, but um, I would pr- pretty much do the same thing that Jacques did. And he, he went to different co- colleagues in different countries and he said, hey, please, could you repeat these experiments um, according exactly to the same protocol that we we use? And sure enough, a whole bunch of people got the same result. And and he put all those names on the paper and and revised the paper so it included um, the results of those people and sent it back again to the editor of Nature. And the response was pretty much the same. I refuse, I, and I don't care how many people can repeat it, can't be right, it's impossible. It just it doesn't make sense, and therefore water memory is 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 nonsense. So um, feeling slightly defeated, um, uh, Jacques began to notice that a lot of people in Paris, there are many homeopaths, and, and some of the homeopaths were thinking, well, this famous scientist is basically confirming what we do every day, confirming it in a scientific way that if you do all these dilutions that we do every day, you really do. There is something to it. Um, and so the pressure from Paris across the channel to London, uh, where nature is headquartered, became intense. And, uh, and Maddox felt the pressure. And so... And what happened, and I remember visiting Jacques, and he said, on that phone right there, I got a call from John Maddox. He said, I'll make a deal with you. Okay, what's the deal? The deal is, I'll publish your paper next week, in next week's edition of Nature, on one condition. You allow a committee of peers to come to the laboratory, look over your shoulder, and then we'll report we'll report back to our readers and uh, what we find and, and Jacques, thinking, my goodness, um, uh, thinking that this was a, a sincere and honest approach, said, yeah, no problem, come. So a month later, they came. And the committee of peers consisted of three people. And the three people um, included the editor himself, John Mad- Maddox, who uh, was not exactly neutral. Um, you know, he was under pressure to relent. Um, to change his mind. And he invited two other uh, so-called peers. And one of them was a guy named Walter Stewart, who had been working in, in, um, at the National Institutes of Health. They have a, a center for scientific integrity. Um, they're in charge of looking for scientific fraud. Um, so you could get an idea of what the, the committee of peers was after. And the third person on the committee um, uh, was the epitome of, of the, the sort of scientific or other fraud. And this was the amazing Randy, otherwise known as James, uh, real name James Randy, uh, who had, had been um, probably the most prominent magician in uh, the world. <laughs> a magician. <laughs> and a magician... Uh, yeah, this guy was famous mostly for debunking the tricks of other magicians. So, so the you know the the group of people coming to this French laboratory, it seemed that they had a mission, and the mission was to demonstrate that all of this is some kind of fraud. So they spent a few days there, and and the first day, the experimenters did their their usual, and they got the usual, the result that they published. The second day they did the usual and, um, and there was some uh, coding, um, giving numbers to, that was done by the committee. And when finally decoded, it also gave it the same result. And the third day, the third day, it, the, it was the, the, the experiment was actually done by Walter Stewart who did all the dilutions himself. 
It turned out it didn't work. It almost worked, but there, there were some deviations. And so, so the committee um, um, went to their hotel and, and they conferred and they concluded that, well, okay, when the French people do it, it, quote, works. And when we do it, it doesn't work. And, and they concluded, I mean, despite the fact that in, in the published paper, they said this does not work every time. However, it, it works uh, a sufficient number of times to easily be statistically significant, more than easily. It just occasionally it doesn't work. And parenthetically, I know that um, sometimes it doesn't work when there's somebody in the vicinity who thinks it shouldn't work. Um, that, that's a different issue that we can get to if you like. But, but at any rate, the group said, we do it, it doesn't work. They do it, it does work. Therefore, it's some kind of uh, trick. And they published uh, uh, something that said that water memory is a delusion, um, a trick. And that was the end of Benveni's career. And he died prematurely, um, a, a rather broken uh, man. So to su uh, summarize in your, your original question, there, there were two debacles that followed. Um, uh, one was 30 years after, after the other. And, and these, these debacles um, meant that prominent people who found something potentially interesting um, about, about water, um, your career is, is in jeopardy if you, if you were to find it. If you want to do something, let's say, pretty boring, uh, dotting the I's and crossing the T's, it's okay, you can, you can do it. But if you happen to find something um, that challenges the status quo, Forget it, because even the most prominent of scientists will, their careers will be destroyed, and that had a, uh, just a, a, a deadening effect. And so there is essentially no water research field. There, there is um, there's a, a group of people who do mostly computer simulations and and some experiments, and they they meet um, um, uh, regularly. It's a rather limited group. And, and we have started uh, something. So I, each year, organize uh, the annual conference on, on, on the physics, chemistry, and biology of water. And it'll be early October in um, a place called Bad Soden, which is near Frankfurt, uh, Germany. It, it's been a very popular meeting with increasing attendance. Of course, we've had problems because of the pandemic, but it, it hopefully will take place. And um, so, so I, we, we kind of like to think that this may be the beginning of a resurgence in, in interest in water because there's so much that's so interesting uh, about water. And I, I apologize for going on and on about this. Oh, but... not, not a problem. I appreciate it. Uh, I, I appreciate the context, actually, and I'm sure those listening will too, because I've, I've actually done a number of podcasts on different elements of, of water around the, uh, over the years. And, um, and they've all been very well received because I think that you and I and the people that come to your group are not alone in our fascination with something so mysterious and so ever present you know it's not it's not just a random molecule that exists in few places on earth and we want to discover where and why and how it's it's everywhere it's everything it's the basis of all life so to me um i think that's why my fascination continues to grow and uh, i appreciate the context I, I did so much digging in your book and it's it's just such a treasure trove of information but something that struck me was kind of early in the book and there's a few mysteries of water that you sort of pose early on and then later in the book explain them and I think it'd be fun to go through some of them just to exemplify the strangeness of this substance and how it behaves in certain ways one of the examples you give is gelatin desserts uh, I'm trying to recollect i mean i know you wrote the book a while ago but you you mentioned like gelatin desserts and diapers um as two examples of and sand castles things like that where oh yeah yeah well yeah so um liquid liquid water um liquid water has has certain properties you know it flows and i think the best example of that is um um if I may deviate slightly from your question, is your your body? So the the kind of fourth phase water that we that we discovered, and I hope I have a chance to to discuss, it, is it's gel like. 
it um, it's not it's not a liquid. It's more like a gel. And um, and your cells, um, we have evidence that your cells are filled with this kind of water, this gel-like, highly viscous water compared to ordinary water. And the way you could demonstrate that really simply is take a knife and cut yourself. If it were liquid water, it would come pouring out uh, as it does from a breached water pipe. Uh, but that doesn't happen. Um, it, it, it stays in. And it stays in because the, the, the water that's in your cells is not liquid water, not for the most part. It's actually uh, this fourth phase um, water, which is gel-like, and it stays there. It stays, it clings to, uh, to the solids that are inside your cell. So it stays. And, um, and, and the same thing, um, well, there, um, I say the same thing, but there's, there, there's um, more, more to it. Uh, um, the idea, the idea that that there's a um, that inside your cells, in particular, that there is a water has a gel-like consistency. Is that sort of like raw egg white? Uh, is what, what we're talking about. Um, uh, the idea is is seventy years old. There was a famous paper by a well-known scientist, uh, uh, not a paper, a book by a guy named Fry Wüstling, a, a German. Um, or maybe he was Austrian. I, I, I can't recall. And the essentially, essentially, um, this water is like a gel, um, and and um, it's a it's a gel like water um, that that can hold together because of the charges that are involved. And in, in, in we'll hopefully get to talk about the charges. This is not neutral water. This is a charged uh, water that can hold things together. And one of the things it, it can hold together is in the case of a sandcastle, uh, you build a sandcastle and you wonder, it, it kind of, the water acts as a kind of glue, um, right? And, you know, liquid water doesn't, there's no reason why it, it should act like a glue. But the water that we're talking about has actually has electrical charge. And if it has electrical charge, it can induce uh, opposite charge by the Faraday induction uh, principle anything that's nearby. So, so the sand in the sand castle, each grain of sand um, uh, nucleates the growth of this special kind of water, which then holds the particles together. So if you have wet sand, you can build a sand castle. If you have dry sand without that water, you can't build anything. It just falls apart. So the, this is one, one example. There are so many anomalies. Uh, there, there's a um, um, website that lists them. There are more than like 60 or 70 or even more than that uh, uh, anomalies of, of, of water. And, uh, um, and the, the number keeps growing. And when you reach a point where you have so many anomalies, uh, anomalies are you know features that you observe, but that they don't fit into the theory. So mostly they get swept under the carpet thinking, ah, you know, we'll leave that for, 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 for later. But when the number of anomalies grow so, so large, you kind of have to scratch your head and think, well, maybe there's something wrong with the, the, the basic theory, because if the theory is right on, then the opposite usually holds. The theory can explain so many things that you hadn't expected it can explain. It's a sign of a, of a proper uh, theory. But if you have to keep adding to it, that's not a good sign. And that's yeah. where that, that's where we are with 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 water. There is another interesting anomaly that you um, um, alluded to in your book, and that's isolated clouds. You know how water vapors go up into the sky and you could have a clear sky and there's just an isolated packet of them just floating there in only one spot, which has always struck me as strange too. And that's, yeah, that's another... it's, it's very strange. You, you have a, uh, either you have an ocean or a giant lake and, and look up and you see one cloud. Um, yeah. Does that imply that the evaporation is occurring from one spot, <laughs> but not <laughs> the spot next to it or what? So if you want to figure out, um, what what's going on um you need to understand you must be able to explain what's what's how how this can happen you know sometimes you can see i was just flying um uh, from europe last week and i'm looking down and there's so many beautiful clouds and they're all separated from from one another and 
you need to be able to explain why why you don't have always have one over an ocean, for example, one large continuous cloud. Well, sometimes you you kind of do, but that's not the the general rule. So how does how does all this happen? Um, and and it's not only that question regarding clouds, um, but uh, what keeps the cloud up in the sky? Um, so if you were, for example, if you were to take a ladder and climb up to the height of the cloud and climb with a pitcher of water and take the water and 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 turn it over, you know what would happen. It would come right down uh, uh, <laughs> like a shower on your head. But clouds don't do that. <laughs> they float up there, but they both contain water. Cloud is essentially water. It may have some ex- extraneous particles and such, but essentially it's water. Um, and and it doesn't behave like your pitcher of water. So what's going on, and um, how do you how do you explain it? Um, and a third anomaly with regard to clouds, sort of an anomaly. Um, if you think of the cloud as as um, wa- water that that's evaporated water that condenses. Well, if you take water and condense it, it forms a liquid. And when it rains, you might expect that somehow the cloud gets unzipped and this water comes down like a waterfall, but it doesn't come down like a waterfall. It comes down little droplets. How do you explain that? So, so these are just a few of the um, phenomena that we witness every day. And most of us never even give a second thought uh, to it, but it's necessary. It's obligatory uh, to be able to explain these phenomena if you want to know about weather. And so uh, as you as you can imagine, I, I have been delving into that. And uh, next book is is almost uh, ready. And it's got four chapters on weather. If you if you and, and weather is obviously water is at the center of, uh, of, of weather. So so whatever whatever new principles that we, we uh, derived as as elaborated in that fourth phase book. Um, need, need to be applied. Uh, if if they're valid, um, then they will play some role in weather. And the surprise is that there's there's no real theory of of weather. Um, if you try to find it, if you try to understand from first principles um, how 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 water evaporates, how they form clouds, why the clouds are distinct, why they float, why they sometimes dark clouds will produce rain and other times they won't produce rain. What's the switch? How does, how does this work? Um, th- there has been no theory that I've ever seen that starts from first principles and works its way toward a hurricane, for example. I've, I've attempted in, in this book um, to, to get there. And I'm just waiting. The book is essentially done. I'm waiting for my artist son who illustrated that fourth phase book. And so many people commented on, on the quality of the artwork. Um, uh, my, my son is a professional artist. He's actually a sculptor. But oh, he's, wow. busy, he's busy remodeling his home. And um, so there's a bit of competition for his time. And I'm just waiting for him to, to finish um, uh, to finish the artwork, and the book is essentially done. And the book actually deals with a bunch of subjects. Um, it's not just weather. Uh, it deals with the unexpectedly central role of electrical charge in phenomena uh, that we see every day, but we really don't understand. We may understand superficially, but w- once you once you uh, descend down from the superficial to one step below, you you run into questions you can't answer. Like, for example, gravitation. Well, everybody knows, quote unquote, that gravitation occurs because masses attract. But then you get to the next level of question: Why do masses attract? And then you you run into um, you know throwing up your arms. And, uh, well, they they just do. You know, and that that ah. doesn't doesn't satisfy. And there are other issues um, like um, in the book that I treat um, uh, that relate to electrical charge. Uh, how do birds fly? So if someone asks you how birds fly, you'd probably say, well, they flap their wings. Um, but I look out from my home um, and there's an eagle's nest nearby and I see the eagles every day pretty much flying. And occasionally they'll flap their wings, but most of the time they don't flap their wings. 
and they they can go up, uh, they, up and down and um, uh, level for long distances without any wing flapping. Um, you know, so question is, well, how does this happen? And there are reflexive responses that, but they don't really bear a signature of, uh, of truth. So, so I, I deal with that subject and I deal with what turns the earth, you know, every 24 hours <laughs> earth turns and what, what's responsible for that? Um, you know, we never think about it. Um, uh, but it's a question that we we need to understand. Uh, another question is, what creates wind? We feel the wind all the time, but uh, what's the source of the wind? And so um, uh, uh, if you look in Wikipedia or something, it'll say, well, a pressure gradient. But how, how, how do you imagine a pressure gradient forms to say, uh, to create a wind gust? So these, these, are, these are issues that, phenomena we see every day but we don't understand them and and so this is my attempt to get there but i don't want to deviate too far from oh it's great it's great Uh, these are these are all things i've wondered about as as an observer and participant and member of nature at large i mean it's just if you pay attention almost nothing makes sense (laughs) (laughs) i mean i've i've like sometimes i have these oak trees here on our property in texas and i look at those trees and i think because my sprinklers have been down for a while because we were building a fence. So we had to have all the water turned off. And I think, how are, how are they getting water? And how does, it, how does the tree get the water from the depth of its roots all the way up to the very top of the tree, 50 feet up, and, and get water into those leaves? You know? And a, there may be a common answer for that, but that's the kind of thing that fuels my day as I sit here at my desk and look outside and go, how the hell is the water getting up there? It's defying gravity. It does, there's no pump inside the tree, for example, you know? Um, yeah, uh, that's, of course, that's a, a good question uh, that um, I, I do address in, uh, in the fourth phase book and in other, other places. And we now actually have, have experiments. Uh, we're formulating a manuscript. And I, I think we, we, we have an answer. But the question is, you know, it's not just fifty foot uh, tree. It could be a redwood tree, three hundred feet. Right, and right. and there are, as as you know, there there are tubes uh, inside the tree. The tubes are called xylem, uh, t- uh, and they go from the roots all the way up to the leaves. And somehow you have to get the water all the way up. But if you think of a, if you think of a tube, um, or, or a, a, a cylindrical vessel that's three hundred feet high filled with water, you can imagine the pressure at the bottom, you know, 300 feet of water uh, pressing down. It's enormous uh, pressure. And yet the water somehow goes up. And th- there have been lots of speculations um, on it, but but we found something um, that I think can, can, can explain it. We, we, we found that if we take a tube um, uh, made of material that's hydrophilic, water-loving, and we immersed it in water. Um, to our surprise, we found that water runs through like, like it would run through a straw. And if you turn it vertically, it, 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 it still works. And we understand the mechanism, but we haven't, we, in, in our interview so far, we haven't talked about the kind of water that we discovered, which is central to the mechanism. But we understand based on these experimental observations that that there can be a system that effectively acts as a pump. And the energy that drives the pump is, is, is actually light. It's in, infrared light that comes from the environment. And the infrared light is absorbed uh, by, by the tree, by your 50-foot tree. Um, and, and the water is actually acting like a transducer, uh, takes that energy and converts it into hydraulic en- uh, force that, that actually drives the water up up the tree. So there is an answer. I think we have the uh, right that's answer. So, that's so cool. And, well, thank, and thank you for your patience on, on getting to the exclusion zone water. I think when I was prepping my uh, manuscript for this, there's like, I really want to set this up because it's the crescendo of sorts is so fascinating to me. And I'm sure the listeners who are not yet familiar with your work, but um, 
I think the phenomenon, the various phenomenon of how water behaves is just so vast and interesting and it's a great setup. Uh, however, before I get to that, there was one question you mentioned, um, you know, the spinning of the earth. And I was watching recently a, cause I like to watch super far out documentaries uh, about anything and everything that's unexplained, but it was like a, uh, basically a documentary that was made by proponents of a flat earth concept. And they were dispelling all of the things um, regarded to the belief system around the earth being a sphere. And one of their main talking points was uh, the fairly well-known fact that water always seeks its own level. So they're showing these large swaths of sea and lakes and various bodies of water and showing how the water is in fact a plane. And I thought that was really interesting because I thought, well, I've never been able to take any water and make it curve. So I mentioned that to a friend of mine um, because we were just discussing wacky stuff. And uh, and he said, yeah, water curves all the time. Water droplets are a sphere. <laughs> I was like, oh, you got me. Okay. So <laughs> water, I don't, I mean, I'm not, you know, asking you to give your take on the shape of the earth, but is it possible, you know, on that model of the earth being round that water curves around it? And if so, what the hell is holding it together? And it's not just flying into space. Uh, well, uh, the, the, the simple answer is that gravitation uh, holds it. And um, the, this, is, this is circumventing the question of, of the nature of gravitation, but gravitation holds it. And also, um, you know, the curvature the curvature is usually um, um, uh, uh, witnessed uh, if you if you have a um, if you're looking over a body of water, say a lake, um, and and you look across and it's really clear and you can see you should be able to see the opposite shore, but if the distance is three or four miles, um, you can't see the people uh, even with a telescope because of this curvature. It, uh, the curvature actually blocks out your linear vision. Um, you can see only, if you're looking a few miles away, you can see only above a certain height. Um, and, you know, this, this is, um, I, I think, um, uh, or might be taken as, as evidence that uh, for the curvature. And, and of course, there's all the satellite um, uh, images that you see, but um, you know it could be argued that these are all faked because we, we there's there's so much um, uh, that that appears on the internet and other places that are faked, and it's possible to argue that. But another you know another um, phenomenon that I always like to think of is if you take off from Austin. Uh, where you live and 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 go west, you um, you land in San Francisco and you take off from there and and go to Tokyo and then uh, from there to Berlin and and um, and from there um, to to New York and um, or DC and then finally back to Austin again and you get back to you know to where where you started. So I guess there are. <laughs> You know, two possible interpretations. One is that the Earth is round, um, and the other one is, okay, if the Earth is flat, and you're able to get back to where you started, it must be like a cube. And um, I, I've been pretty <laughs> conscientious. I like to look out the window when I fly, which is pretty often, and I I could never identify the edge of that cube. <laughs> right. And so therefore, right. I I conclude that um, you know that those satellite images are telling the truth and that really looks as though the earth is is a sphere or is round is certainly not flat well so that, that's my take on yeah, it but based on wrong. based on water was my friend's assertion right that water does in fact curve when you look at a, a droplet of water it's a round sphere absolutely right? yeah, yeah. yeah yeah and and you can even see it we took um an example is uh, we we have a, a beaker of water, and you take a charged rod, and uh, a glass rod that's uh, pre-charged, and you bring it closer and closer, and you see the surface lifting toward the rod. Um, um, and the reason the reason is electrostatic because because the charged rod is inducing opposite charge in in the top of the water, and it moves uh, toward toward the rod. So. So you can see a kind of rise in the water. And that's a bit artificial, but you can certainly demonstrate it. And we've also found that um, that the surface of the water tends to be uh, uh, different from 
from the rest of the water. And we, we I don't want to jump into that because we haven't discussed the material that that comes first. But I, I mean, frankly, I, I've been able to, um, I haven't been able to see any compelling evidence um, for the flatness of the earth. Got it. Thank I love you. alternative ideas and theories, but yeah, that, yeah. that one has not. Yeah, well, it's it's funny, and I wish I remembered the name of the documentary. I mean, of course, with these type of films, the production value is exceedingly low, so you you have to really be committed with some deep curiosity to get through it. But some of the experience, the experiments they did, in fact, were using high powered telescopes over large bodies of water. I think they did one in Michigan, and they would zoom and zoom and zoom and show that you could see it perfectly without the interference of a curve. Contrary to your prior statement, who knows? It doesn't matter. This is uh, the point was I want to, you know, find out from a water expert, does it curve? And, you know, it does. Um, however, I would want to get now into the uh, four principles of water that you identified. Um, the first one being, and this is the, you know, the kind of the, the meat of your work with exclusions on water. The first principle being that water has four phases as opposed to the three that we've always assumed. So we know about uh, ice, liquid, and vapor. And yet your work is largely focused around exclusion zone or EZ water. So let's go ahead and, and dive into that because I have so many more questions about exclusion zone water in general and how it might uh, benefit us to learn more about it and you know, learn how to integrate it into our lifestyles, et cetera. Okay. Um, so um, uh, where to start? Um, it all starts... It all starts, if, if I may, with with a a, a, a guy, um, a Chinese scientist who came to the U.S. whose name is Gilbert Ling, and um, and Gilbert Ling, uh, if, I'm taking a historical um, point of view, if that if that's okay. It, um, um, in 1948, he and two other Ch young Chinese scientists were selected from throughout China to come to study in the U.S. So you can imagine the quality of, um, of the people who they chose. There was a physicist, a chemist, and a biologist. And Ling was a biologist. And the physicist went on to win a Nobel Prize, you know. <laughs> um, so these, these were, were top-level people. And, and I, I'm told that they all thought that Gilbert Ling, the guy I'm talking about, was actually the cleverest of, of all three. And I, in retrospect, he passed a couple of years ago. I, I think he should have won a few Nobel prizes for all of his, his contributions, but, um, but they were controversial. So he, he said the water in biology is different, uh, different from ordinary water. Um, he said, he said, uh, he had evidence. Uh, he didn't just spout out. He was, it was based on evidence that the water molecules were somehow, um, uh, ordered or aligned like soldiers at attention. Now, in liquid water, uh, like the stuff that I should be drinking more of, mm. so says my doctor, <clears throat> um, the molecules are randomly disposed and they're bouncing around a, a fierce number of times per second or per femtosecond even. Um, you know, and, and he said, no, no, the evidence is that in biology, in the cells, the water is different. The, the molecules are actually lined up. And so you could think of a water molecule as a dipole plus uh, like a little bean with plus at one end and minus at the other end. And you can imagine these beans lined up like soldiers at attention. He said, this is what, um, this is what the water in biology or inside the cell looks like. And you can imagine uh, this was not a popular uh, point of view, but he had a good deal of evidence. And, and I, I met him at a, a conference uh, in, in Hungary. And it, the conference was to commemorate um, the scientific life of a, a, a famous um, Hungarian scientist. And and the scientists had two fields of interest. One is muscle was muscle contraction, and the other was water. And I'd been in the field of muscle contraction, so I was invited to present my um, ideas about how muscles contracted. And other people were invited to talk about water. And among those people invited was Gilbert Ling, and an entourage of people who had evidence that was consistent with Ling's point of view. So I presented my stuff, 
you know. Um, and uh, I started listening to Gilbert Ling and I was completely intrigued by what he had to say and even more intrigued by the people who had independent evidence to support his point of view that, that the water was different in biology, somehow different. And what I want to tell you is that uh, what we finally wound up studying showed that Gilbert Ling was onto something really important, but it turns out to be, I think, a little different from what he exactly was, was espousing. The order, yes, but a different different kind of, um, of, of order. Anyway, I came back uh, from that uh, conference uh, really charged with uh, energy, you might say, and I didn't trust myself because I can be naively attracted to uh, uh, certain ways of thinking. I'm susceptible to that. And so I, I gave one of his books by the time by that time he had written four or five to my students, uh, to some of uh, the students in my lab. And the feedback was uniform. If this guy is right, uh, it changes everything in biology. And it looks like he might be right. I was compelled that my students um, were able to conclude the same as I had um, tentatively concluded. And I, as I usually do, I want to do something about it. <laughs> I, um, so what do I do? So the first thing I do is write a book. The reason for writing a book, the book was designed to, to, um, uh, to present Ling's ideas to uh, people who might not be experts. And, uh, and the reason for, for doing that is uh, Gilbert's writing um, is, is, for some, impenetrable. It's really difficult. And I, I knew Gilbert well enough to know. He'd sit down at the word processor and earlier than that, at the typewriter, he'd bat out something, send it to the publisher, and it gets published. And um, he, he, was, uh, he lacked the sensitivity necessary, I think, to, to put his concepts in, into terms that are easily understandable. So I tried to do that. I tried to make his ideas understandable to the general public with maybe a smattering of background in, 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 in science. And I'm not sure if I succeeded or didn't, but, um, yeah, but I went, I went beyond that. The second half of the book, um, uh, adduces evidence, um, to say that this kind of what Gilbert Ling told called structured water, which we now, um, called easy, as you mentioned, or, or a fourth phase, uh, water, um, that this was actually central uh, in 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 uh, all of the major mechanisms uh, uh, that the cell un undergoes. Um, we 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 compelled. We found the evidence. We I, um, with the help of some of my my students, uh, that when muscle contracts or when secretory cells secrete or when nerve cells conduct, uh, whatever the, 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 the operation um, uh, of, a, of a cell, it involves water. It involves a transition from this structured water that exists when the cell is quiescent, when it's not doing its thing, to um, ordinary liquid water um, when it is doing its thing, and then back again at the end. So when a muscle contracts, for example, uh, before it contracts, the, the water is ordered in a way that's a little bit different from uh, what, what Ling su suggested uh, to uh, uh, ordinary liquid water and, and then back again. And that was the second, second half of the book. And if you think about it, you mentioned that uh, if you do a molecular count that more than 99% of our molecules are water molecules because you know, they're two thirds by volume. And to fill that volume, um, you need a lot of those minuscule water molecules. So if you do a molecular count, you know, line up all the molecules, more than 99 out of 100 are going to be water molecules. And, and the books tell us that water molecules don't do much. They're sort of sitting as the background carrier of the more important molecules of life. It's like a bathtub. You know, you sit in the bathtub and you're surrounded by the water. That's pretty much what the water does, according to the textbooks, and the textbooks still um, basically say that, which strikes me as arrogant. How could you? 
how could anybody imagine that 99% of the molecules in our body don't do anything? Well, the evidence is clearly against. Um, the, the water molecules are central to, to so, many, uh, so many processes that, that, that go on. Anyway, um, so that was the, the second half of that book. And after writing the book, um, which got mixed reviews, uh, um, oh, uh, some reviews that, oh, this is more nonsense. Uh, just, just like Gilbert Ling, everything that comes out of Ling's mouth is nonsense. So pay no attention to it. To um, uh, a cell bio, well-known cell biologist from Harvard uh, who said, this is a 305 page preface to the future of cell biology, which I liked better than, <laughs> than yeah. you know. Yeah. You know. <laughs> I'll take so, that endorsement. Uh, yeah, it's nice to, yeah. And, and and so, well, after that, what do we do? Well, what we do is start experiments. Um, Got to do experiments to to find out because this is so so compellingly interesting about, about water and about the possibility that biological water is different from other water. Well, it turns out it's not just biological, it's all over the place. So we started experiments and by serendipity, um, we, we found... Uh, uh, um, we found an experimental preparation that we could use. And, um, and by serendipity, the right people came to my laboratory to work and everything, uh, everything just worked out beautifully. And so within a year or so, we had evidence that there was something um, different. There was a different kind of water. And okay, so what did we find? Um, this long introduction. Um, so the, the, the experiment, the main experiment that we did, and we we're still doing it, is you take water and and put some particles in the water, and then immerse inside the water uh, some material. It could be it could be a gel, it could be a polymer, but it had to be hydrophilic, that is water loving, the kind of surface where you know if you drop water, it spreads out uh, because the surface loves. The water and wants to get as much of it as it can, so it loves it. So it's hydrophilic, water loving, as opposed to Teflon, where you know you drop the water, it beads up. It had to be. So we put the material in the water, and we looked in the microscope, and what we found astonished us. Um, so we found that right next to the material or the or the gel, um, the microspheres, the particles in the water began to get excluded. They were like pushed out, pushed away from the surface. Um, and, and, and they were pushed away by uh, appreciable uh, amounts by, uh, you know, maybe uh, um, half, uh, up to half a millimeter. You could even see it with your naked eye. You didn't, didn't need the microscope to see it. Um, and, and we knew that Gilbert Ling's ideas, we were prompted by his ideas, of course. He, in, in his ideas, um, the molecules were lined up. And if they're lined up, it's like a crystal. Um, and crystals, as they form, if they're pure, they obviously have excluded all of the contaminants. So um, they, they push them out. Like you'd find, for example, in ice and the... Uh, in a glacial moraine, all the junk is at the bottom of the glacier, and 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 the crystal uh, of water, the ice is clear, is is pure. So that's what we were looking for, and we found it right away. So um, we did a lot of experiments, and I'll I'll, I'll just summarize a few of the uh, the more important uh, findings. Um, 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 one finding is. Um, uh, one finding is that this region, every physical chemical measure of the water that's in this region where, where all the particles, the microspheres were excluded, um, every, everything we measured differed from ordinary water. Um, so um, that's one thing. It had a higher density. Uh, there was organization, clear crystalline-like organization, high viscosity. And also electrical charge. So this this region typically uh, had negative charge, and the region beyond had positive charge. And the, you have to have both because all of this is built from water molecules, which are neutral. So if you have a negative region, you got to have a positive region. This, in fact, if I might digress for just a second, uh, 
this forms a battery. You have negative and positive that are separated. And we demonstrated that indeed you stick two electrodes in and you can get electrical energy out of it. Okay, so next thing we we found that that the structure of this is not the dipoles uh, that the stack dipoles that Ling was talking about because dipoles are neutral. You can stack dipoles from here to the moon and you'll never get negative charge. But the experimental results dictated that this, this region of exclusion um, bore negative charge. See, so couldn't be right. And, and we found that the structure was actually a hexagonal structure, um, a planar sheet planar sheets that stack. So, so if you, for example, if you have a gel here next to the water, the gel would nucleate the buildup of the first layer um, and the first layer would then the hexagonal layer, um, uh, like a honeycomb uh, pattern. And that layer would nucleate the growth of the next one from ordinary water and then the next one. And so you, it would build sheet, sheet by sheet. And um, so not not the same as what Gilbert had been suggesting, but, but the same theme, but but different and especially important was the fact that it was charged, had negative charge. So because um, we began seeing this this feature again and again because it excluded particles, a colleague from Australia, a physical chemist, said, "You know, you ought to give it a name." Um, and he said, "Well, the obvious name is exclusion zone." because the, this zone excludes. It was a, actually in retrospect, it was a poor choice. Uh, it had advantages and disadvantages. The disadvantage is that it doesn't really describe um, um, the central and important role beyond just exclusion uh, because there are so many other interesting properties. Uh, um, but anyway, the, the name kind of stuck. And later we also called it fourth phase water because it, it, it was uh, different. And, and I guess the one maybe final uh, property I should I should mention um, it, uh, is uh, um, uh, the, the, this has energy. You know, when 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 you have a, a battery like um, configuration, it has potential energy, and that we found later that that potential energy can drive many. Um, biological and non-biological processes is really important. However, the point I, uh, I, I wanted to make um, is, is um, um, uh, how should I, how should I uh, put it? Um, um, well, let me just for, first say the name, um, exclusion zone, EZ, it's, it's easy, easy to remember. Um, you know, but it doesn't work in other countries because the Z is a Z, so it's EZ to remember. But, but okay, because this has energy, you can't get something for nothing. You can't get energy out of nowhere. Um, it's like your cell phone battery. You know, it's got, it's got energy. It's got potential energy. It runs your cell phone, but if you don't recharge it, it's not going to work. And it's the same with the system. You have to recharge it. So where does the energy come from? And we were scratching our heads, our collective heads, for for years, uh, several years before a student uh, found out where the energy comes from. And he was doing a simple experiment like the one I was just describing. And he took a lamp and he shined the lamp and he called me in to show me that where the lamp, uh, where the light was incident on on the exclusion zone, the exclusion zone grew by leaps and bounds. And then he took it away and it returned. So it didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that all of what I've told you is fueled uh, by light energy. And we did experiments afterward. We found the particular wavelengths and they, they actually lie in the infrared range, not in the visible range. So infrared light, which many would, would think about heat, it's not exactly the same as infrared, but close enough to think that um, um, this kind of energy is, it turns out it's around, it's all around us. So um, it's all, all over. If, if you were to turn off the lights in your, in your studio and someone would come in with an infrared camera, just like an ordinary camera, but with an infrared sensor instead of a visible light sensor, 
and try to get an image of you, even though you could see nothing, uh, you get a beautiful image of you, the plants, the sofa, the walls, uh, everything. Everything is generating infrared. So the energy that's necessary for the buildup of all that I've told you comes from uh, our surround. It's always there, which means, which means that if the circumstances are right, if you've got a hydrophilic surface next to water, you'll always have some easy water, fourth phase water. I think I'd better stop because I'm running on and on and on. And you have many other questions. No, it's it's great. That's a that's a really perfect explanation and also a great setup for some of the the further questions that I have specifically around easy water. Um, the first one being a a popular topic, I think that's emerging to become even more so is structured or ordered water. So I've had people on the show talking about structured water and uh, the idea that in nature water is traveling in vortices and is thus structured. And then when we harness water for consumption and use, we put it into, you know, a still vessel or we run it through right angle piping in our homes, et cetera, and thus um, kind of ruin or spoil that water or make dead water, like thinking about um, Victor Schauberger or Rudolf Steiner, which who, both of whom you mentioned in your book briefly. Um, so that kind of paradigm, but what I was curious was, um, is the common um, sort of understanding of structured water the same thing as easy water? In other words, if I if I use one, I have many structuring devices, this great thing called the um, uh, analemma. It's a little uh, crystal vial that you spin in water and it has what's called a mother water in it that influences the rest of the water. Another thing called a natural action, little v- vortexer and all kinds of toys like that. If one is structuring water in that context, are you creating or encouraging more easy water or is easy water a different kind of structured water? Um, the word structured um, uh, precedes uh, our label of fourth phase or easy structured structured water. It, it's a it's a general term. Um, And um, I don't know if it was coined by Gilbert Ling or by others uh, before him. And it's meant to imply that that the liquid water is not just a a collection of randomly oriented bouncing uh, molecules, but it has order to it. It has structure to it. And uh, the problem with with that term, which has persisted for a long time, is everything has structure, you know, so... So the term <laughs> structure, I mean, what is it that has no structure? Even if it's a right. random structure, it's a structure. Right. So, um, so I gave you a bit of the history of why we um, suggested the use, the term easy water, which turns out to be not, uh, it's convenient, it's natural. But I think fourth phase water best describes it because it's indeed a, 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 different, a different phase of, of, uh, of, of water. And um, now the second part of your question re- relates to water structuring devices and um, and get put me back on track if I go off track because I have a tendency to 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 um, do that uh, sometimes. First, with regard to vortices, um, a lot of people have, especially the the great naturalist uh, Victor Schauberger, have talked about vortices creating living water and. And um, living water is water that is in, endowed with energy. The problem um, with that is, um, while I think it could be true and probably is true, um, I've yet to see a really good experiment uh, that demonstrates uh, that if you have a vortex, uh, the vortex uh, builds easy or fourth phase water. We tried it ourselves in the lab, and I included something in the book, but it, it was... Uh, I think not a, a convincing presentation. I think this needs desperately to be done because it's a simple expedient that anybody can, can use to put water in the vortex. And, and, and the problem is you have to examine the water during the time it's in the vortex, possibly. It could be that um, if, you, if you establish a vortex, you're establishing or creating easy water. But after the vortex ceases, uh, it may revert back to ordinary bulk water who knows and and so the i guess the 
ideal way to do the experiment is to measure the water during the time it's being vortexed, but that's a challenge. Needs to be done. <laughs> I, I would put it high on the list of um, so 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 we don't we aren't really sure about vortex water, but if I had to bet, I'd bet that the result would be would be positive. Regarding devices, um, so there are many, many companies um, who talk about uh, uh, having devices that they produce that produce structured water of some kind, and some even call it fourth phase water or easy water. Um, uh, and I, I think it's obligatory for these companies who market their water to, to demonstrate uh, that it's really what they've gotten. And, and many of them uh, have not demonstrated at least uh, what I've seen. Uh, and so, you know, that raises a, a question whether it's really true or not true. And I, I could imagine it is true in many, if not most cases, but I think it's obligatory for people um, uh, uh, you know, to, to be able to properly check out the water. In fact, um, you know, the water is, is suggested to be good for health. And I think it would be good for health because your cells are full of easy water, fourth phase water. And if they're not full of that water, then they're dysfunctional and in, in, in some way. And, and, you know, you may wind up with a muscle cramp or a headache or depression or, depending on where where the water is deficient so so the water should be beneficial for health and I think a lot of a lot of the people producing waters of some sort are aware of uh, of that fact and they're they're um, aware of the usefulness of that water I would put the burden on them to actually demonstrate and it, it's quite possible that some of them have demonstrated I I haven't seen it but this is uh, uh, I think important you know some years ago um, I proposed to the National Institutes of Health that we study the, the beneficial effects of water on health or the putatively beneficial effects of certain waters on health. And, and the response, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, water? Uh, whoever could imagine that water is important in, <laughs> in cells and in, in life. You know, it was, it wasn't the exact response, but it was... You know, so so the NIH is eager and willing to spend uh, hundreds of millions of dollars of dollars on on testing the drug, some drug produced by a pharmaceutical company. But the idea of testing waters on different types of waters on health is something that um, uh, it, so far I I've seen no interest at all. Uh, it, it would need to be done by someone. Uh, a third party. We proposed ourselves uh, at the time. We've, we're on to other things at the moment, but uh, we proposed that it it not be a commercial entity. It be a neutral entity, an entity that has some experience dealing with with water. And um, and I suppose for something like five million or ten million dollars, clinical studies could be done. Uh, for example, taking some patients with. Um, I don't know, uh, uh, stomach cancer, or if, you, if you will, um, and and um, uh, giving a group of water, a, a group, one type of water, another uh, dozen patients with a different kind of water and so on, uh, uh, experimenting by uh, giving them uh, 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 any of a half dozen types of waters and, and checking after a year or two years, how, how did they fare? You know, it's a straightforward experiment, but of course, it's not simple to implement. It requires all kinds of controls and and lots of people involved in doing the statistics and and the experiments themselves. And but it could turn out to be um, a critically Im Im important advance. It's necessary first to convince the folks at NIH that water is really important, and and. <laughs> You know, Convin <laughs> convincing them of that when there's a conflict of interest between the pharmaceutical country uh, companies and the fact that the probability of patenting any type of water is very low, <laughs> you know, patenting water as a drug. So I think it's going to be up to citizen scientists and, and people like you to, you know, bring bring attention to this. Um, back to the, the structured water and, and yeah. water that's beneficial to health, something comes to mind and that is the 
you know, longstanding folklore of healing waters around the world from indigenous people soaking in natural hot springs that were purported to have healing and restorative benefits to different cold springs around the planet where waters have been reported um, to be incredibly healing. And again, you know, there, there aren't studies to prove it, but I've always found it fascinating that humans have migrated and settled around certain springs, both hot and cold, and actually built civilization around those springs. And it's not just because we know we need hydration. There seems to be something special about different waters that the earth produces or contains around the world. Uh, I'm curious if you've, if you've heard anything even anecdotally around people having um, positive outcomes with, with different natural waters from around the world. Yeah, I have. And uh, I think there's, there's something to it. Um, so a couple of examples. Um, uh, one example is, is the Hunza people um, somewhere in, in Asia. And it was, I forget his name, uh, some Nobel laureate in, in fluid flow who went to examine uh, what was going on there. And he, he was able to conclude that, that there was something in the water um, uh, that kept these civilizations um, or that particular civilization um, healthy. And the Hunza people are known to like to, to sire babies at age 100 and, um, and, and live long, productive and uh, healthy, um, healthy lives. So the, the, the water seemed to have, have a, a real, real impact um, that, and, and the, those studies uh, are known and, and published. And then there's another one uh, that has, has impressed me. Um, a friend of mine uh, who's interested in water uh, came up upon a, a spring in Idaho and uh, it's southeastern Idaho, and the story of this is um, it, it's it's owned by Native Americans, uh, or it had been owned by Native Americans. And the story is that um, um, when when a chief had to be a chief uh, became ill, um, the chief would migrate from wherever around the country to this special spring in Idaho, and stay there and live there for a period of time and drink the water. And the water was said to have um, uh, uh, certain healing qualities, and it became really well known. And it was reserved for chiefs only, and not for the peons, uh, so to, so to speak. And um, and my friend um, is trying now is trying to do something uh, uh, commercially to bring that to, to fruition because of the the history that that comes with it and the apparent efficacy, which he's, he's now studying. So, so wow. this is, this is one example, um, which, you know, may, may turn out to be a, a really fruitful example. There are lots of challenges associated with, with actually taking the water itself and, 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 and converting it into, you know, or bottling it or uh, however producing it to make, making it available to the people. It's not, it's not a simple thing to do. So those are those are a couple of examples um, that I've heard about, know a little about. And there are others. Um, and when I uh, I try to, shall we put it, re remain independent of any particular product because because um, you know I, I I treasure my reputation as a as a scientist um, and. And um, I don't. I don't want to be touting the the um, efficacy of uh, a company's particular kind of water. You know that. Yeah. Okay. yeah. You you understand? But yeah, I'm, totally. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's why I enjoy doing what I do because I'm I'm not beholden to uh, scientific rigor. It's just you know n equals one experimentation and trying to find the best of the best out there. And water is something, as I said, that I've spent a lot of time researching and exploring and, and also sharing with people. Um, to that end, uh, in terms of some sort of evidence as to the different qualities of water, I, I think you're familiar with a, a former, a recent former guest, Veda Austin, uh, who photographs water, as well as um, Dr. Emoto from Japan, who was, uh, I'm sure, as you know, a, a pretty famous guy in the realm of water. And both of them using different techniques to photograph water. And 
and actually showing pretty unequivocally, I would say that our intention, consciousness, energy, call it what you will, has an impact on water to the point where it appears, especially in the work of Veda Austin, um, to have an intelligence. And you've talked about um, some early scientist purporting that water, you know, contains memory and such in the case of homeopathy, et cetera, um, being debunked. But now it seems that more people are becoming curious and doing some of this experimentation, showing that water does in fact have it very unique properties depending on the stimuli to which it's exposed. So I wonder what your take is on the various water photography and what that might mean for us moving forward. I, I know Veda uh, Austin uh, pretty well. And, and I know the um, Emoto people, although um, unfortunately, um, um, Masara Emoto, um, I, I had invited to our water conference several times and he, he was ill. And finally, I um, invited him to my home because he was coming to the Pacific Northwest and he accepted. But unfortunately, he passed um, a few weeks before. And so I, I never got to meet him in person, although we shared the, we shared the platform on and uh, on an interview, um, but I know all the people, uh, pretty much all the people who worked in so-called office emoto in um, in in Japan, and one starting with emoto, who was the obviously the pioneer in in, in that sort of thing. And for uh, for your viewers who don't or listeners who don't know about um, um, emoto, he he uh, he was a spiritualist. He wasn't a scientist and. And he would put his attention, he'd have a, um, some Petri dishes filled with water. And he's put, a, he put his attention, uh, intention toward the water. He'd think about peace or think about love. And then he'd freeze the water and he'd look at the water crystals. And he'd also um, um, uh, subject them to feelings of, um, uh, oh, I hate you or uh, something equivalent, you fool or something like this. And he'd freeze and look. And the crystals, the water crystals were ugly. And he'd also play music. And if the music was John Lennon, um, Imagine, or uh, uh, the Mozart Symphony, or, uh, uh, or, or Bach, uh, he'd get beautiful crystals. Uh, if it was heavy metal, he'd get ugly crystals. But there was one problem. And, and the problem was explained to me by his former translator, who was always on the spot to answer questions. And he told me that, that when Emoto would present to a group, inevitably the questions would arise. How did you choose your data? And the, the truth was that among the 50 or so Petri dishes that he picked the, the one that showed best, that best showed what he wanted to show. <laughs> <laughs> and this oh, poor guy, the translator, was on the spot to justify <laughs> his approach. And he told me it became awkward and eventually uh he after after some years he finally uh, finally quit um and you know it, it it's an issue um and um but his his response was well i'm not a scientist i'm a spiritualist and and so as a spiritualist that he felt that he was justified um in 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 doing it his way and in, in in choosing the one that best illustrated what he wanted to illustrate well you, you know that that among scientists that's <laughs> arguable whether that's a reasonable approach but you know i i've i've been well connected not only to the emoto people but um uh, also to veda austin and um and to some others who are doing it trying to encourage them to check the repeatability of what they're doing and veda is doing that uh, right now, and some other people are beginning to do it, and I'm astonished by what I've heard that uh, about the repeatability. It is repeatable. Uh, some images. Um, so Veda was actually at my home um, uh, one day, and she wanted to illustrate. She said, "Think about about some image," and I I thought about a house. Okay. And, and focus my attention on it. And then she took the Petri dish with water, uh, which was sitting in front of me. She put it in the freezer for only 10 minutes and she took it out and it was a thin layer of ice on top. And, and sure enough, I could see <laughs> the, the slope <laughs> roof. Uh, and that was, of course, N equals one. Um, yeah. But it, uh, it, 
it was representative. So, so those, those experiments, I think, are um, going uh, to demonstrate, they're in the process, that there's something going on there that seems to be repeatable. And if it's repeatable, it's likely to be, to be real. But it's not, it's not just those people. So uh, the field attracted after, after Jacques Mendenis, it attracted multiple people who demonstrate year after year at our annual conference um, that's going to take place in October um, in Germany, um, evidence for different approaches, but also that demonstrate water, water memory. And I guess the, the most prominent of people is um, a guy named Luc Montagnier, um, who won a Nobel Prize. Um, he, was, he had been friends with Jacques Benveniste, and when Benveniste died, he took over and he decided to shift the emphasis of his research um, from uh, virology uh, to water and water information and water memory. So it's interesting that, you know, so distinguished a, a scientist was attracted. And he came to our conference each year and presented his work. And, and, and one of the experiments that he did is, if true, and it seems to be true because it, it's been repeated and published by several groups uh, confirming it, he's able to, um, he, he, he was able to prove that the information from DNA could be transmitted, not chemically, but through some kind of subtle energy uh, that is yet to be defined uh, to water um, um, and, 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 and held in, in the water. So, so he, his experiment consisted of he took DNA in, in water or in a buffer and sitting next to water. And the two were completely sealed. No, no possibility of any chemical uh, contra uh, uh, communication. And he added some generic energy, 60 hertz, 50 hertz, um, uh, uh, whatever. And, and the DNA was a short strand uh, of any of a number of uh, uh, different kinds of uh, DNA. And he would dilute it and dilute it and dilute it, um, uh, eventually diluting it to uh, homeopathically to, to the point that it was essentially just water that had been exposed to the DNA. Uh, but prior to that, only modest dilutions, but the result was the same. So after 24 hours, he took this, threw it away, and he'd have water. He said, this water is now informed with information from, from the DNA or from the water that surrounded the DNA. And to, to prove his point, um, he took this water and used it in the PCR test, the same as now is, is used so commonly for uh, COVID. Um, and, and the DNA that came out of it had, had the same sequence as the DNA that was sitting here in this container. So proving that there's some kind of subtle information coming from here to the water. Otherwise, you wouldn't have gotten that result. And as I said, it's been confirmed. So, so I, what, I, what I mean to say that it, it's not just Emoto, a, a spiritualist and um, other people, but multiple scientists who have all kinds of different pieces of different approaches and, uh, and, and different pieces of evidence that the water can store information, um, including all the way up to Nobel Prize winner. And a, another one, um, Brian Josephson, another Nobel Prize winner uh, who hasn't done experiments of this sort himself, but is um, espousing the, uh, the theory. So, you know, it's, it's morphed into, um, into a weird observation by some spiritualist uh, to, to what it has, is, is soon, I think, becoming a very interesting um, uh, frontier area in science. Wow, that's exciting. What a trip with the DNA experiment. That is Isn't that's Isn't just it? far out. That's what, I love being a human on Earth for reasons like that. <laughs> it's, just, it's just fascinating. There's so many things we just don't understand. And the things that I think for me, the things that can't be explained are the most interesting. Once something's explained, it's kind of like, oh, okay, well, now we know how that works. You know, what, what else is there to it, right? But it's the mystery. Um, when it comes to the fourth phase water and its relationship to infrared light, I mean, knowing that our cells benefit so much from having this type of water in and around them, um, 
would infrared saunas, red light therapy, sunbathing, um, cold immersion, ice baths, cryotherapy, where we're using, I guess in that case, the infrared heat within our body, I would assume is, is going to move that fourth phase water around our capillaries and veins. Are there, is there any evidence or do you believe that things like hot and cold therapy, light therapy, and things like that will help us to produce more of this fourth phase water within our bodies or utilize it um, more effectively? I absolutely think so. I think, you know, you've, you've, you've hit on a, a, a really important point. Um, um, so um, let me first um, address hot and, and cold because um, before I forget, because it's really important, uh, you know, reflexive response. Well, well, if infrared or heat uh, really helps, then the cold should do the opposite. But, but in fact, it looks as though uh, cold does, does the same. And, and I think the reason is, uh, first of all, we established that infrared light uh, grows the easy like crazy. It, it mod- very modest amounts of infrared light it can, can bring about a 10 times growth in the amount of easy water. So it's, it's really powerful. You know, and it follows, it follows that if, if um, easy water ordinary fills our cell, cells and, and we expose those cells, to infrared light, uh, it should build easy. And if easy is central to function, it should improve function. Um, at the same time, uh, Wim Hof and, uh, and others have shown that if, if you immerse yourself into cold, you also get a beneficial effect. And, and why is that? When I, th- I think you're right, and, and it's, it's the metabolic energy that's produced inside our body. Um, and, and, and that produces heat, it produces infrared uh, energy. And, and ordinarily, uh, we, we know that infrared energy, um, uh, like for example, at night when, when the earth cools off, the infrared energy um, is being radiated from the earth out into the cold um, environment out there. Somehow it gets there. How it, how it gets there is, I think, not, not so well understood, but the infrared radiates uh, from warmth uh, to cold. Um, and, um, and then you think about your body and you've got a core, a metabolic core of infrared energy and it radiates outside the body to, to the area beyond. And in so doing, it passes through all the tissues and in passing through the tissues, it pretty much, you might surmise, it does pretty much what, what the infrared energy does that's coming in from the outside. So it doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's bi-directional. It could come in or it could go out. It passes through the tissues and as it passes through the tissues, um, it builds easy water. And if easy water is is important for health, which uh, we we believe from all the evidence um, that we've gathered, it's absolutely important uh, for health. Uh, then it's going to work. So so um, you know that is that is critically important. And 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 there have been um, there have been some. Uh, approaches to um, um, light therapy. There are many groups studying light therapy and red light is, is included. And I've, I've run into clinicians. Uh, I don't know if the work is published because I, I don't <laughs> have time to follow all publications, but, but I was impressed by one guy I met when I was giving a talk in Germany. He's a physician. He approaches me. He said, I use infrared light therapy and it works brilliantly. I deal with cancer, he said. Um, and um, sometimes women particularly will approach me and they have some, some cancer that is grown somewhere on their face and they don't want surgery because it's disfiguring. And so they come to me and I apply infrared and the cancer goes away right away. It's so, so quick and so obvious. And you know, it, it, I'm, I'm wondering and thinking, well, by applying infrared energy, it's returning the cells that are dysfunctional to cells that return to function. And I could imagine that it's simply a matter of building easy water, which then converts those those cells back into in, into normally functioning cells. Um, so light therapy is 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 important. Um, it's used, it's becoming more and more important. And, and some of the people are using infrared. I think a lot of the, 
A lot of it is anecdotal. My colleague tells me there are some published papers on it. I think it's um, important, and I think it's going to become um, increasingly uh, important for the use of uh, infrared therapy. And you've had the experience yourself. In Austin, I'm not sure how many... um, how many saunas um, exist? Um, <laughs> I've I've got I've got three here at the house. Oh, okay, yeah. Which, which is probably funny to some people that live here because I think it's 104 degrees here today, and people are probably thinking, "Why on earth do you need a sauna?" Um, but I also like to get in the sun a lot. But the relationship between the easy water and sauna therapy, red light therapy, is really interesting to me because I just know that. Like, for example, I started my day today. I stood on a vibration plate in front of a, my Juve red light, which has near and uh, I think near, mid, and far infrared. For about 10 minutes, felt great, got all my circulation, lymphatics moving. Uh, and then I took a sauna in this thing called the sauna space, which is a near infrared incandescent um, light bulb sauna, essentially a little tent. Um, actually, no, first I did the, the, the juve red light. Then I jumped in the ice bath. Then I went into the, oh the, the near infrared sauna. And then I went back in the ice bath. And I'm telling you, man, there is, there is nothing that I've found. And maybe this is, takes an hour to do all this, you know, but there's nothing I've found that makes me feel reliably as good as that routine. Hot, cold, hot, cold. Even if, especially if I do it a number of times. I mean, today I just got cold, hot, then cold, but if I go to a hot springs and there's cold water there, I'll do that for hours and I feel like I'm just elated afterward. Um, and not only just the mood regulation of it, but the energy production. Like I just feel so much more energy after that um, when one would think you would be depleted from being hot and cold over and over again. I find the more I do it and with the, the more regularity with which I do it, I just have increasing metabolic energy. So there's... Oh, well. There's got to be a yeah. There's got to be a connection there with the water. Uh, so I'm really pleased to hear that you know you you think there might be as well. Um, on to more of the fourth phase water. I have a device here by a company called Eng3 called the Nano V. I'm, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. I have one. Oh, okay. So well, let's see if I can pull it up here for the people in the video. I keep this thing on my desk for you guys watching on the video. Now I've blocked out the the red light on the instrument panel here with some red or the blue light with some red tape because I turn it on at night and I don't want that in my face. But in this little uh, vessel here on top, there's distilled water. And somehow these guys have figured out how to make fourth phase water in a fine vapor that you breathe. And this uh, water then goes into your system and gets in, into your cells, which I think is just, it's got to be one of the coolest inventions ever. And it again, like the therapies I mentioned earlier, it makes me feel amazing, which is why I have it here on my desk. I just sit here and breathe it in as I work a couple times a day. And I've been doing that for years. And, and they, I think, have a decent body of research and evidence to prove its efficacy but I'm really looking forward to um, to more of these type of developments where people start to learn about this phase of water and actually use their creativity and ingenuity to bring more accessibility to people. Now, this device is pretty pricey. Uh, it's you know I think typically used in a holistic healing clinics and things like that. Uh, but many people I know have them and they've they've saved their money and found and found the value in it. Um, What's your take on on this? You said you have one. What's your take on this particular technology? Do you see anything else like this emerging that could be useful in this way? Well, I, I think you know a lot of things can be emerging, and um, as I said, I, um, I I don't like to tout any. Oh yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. Uh, yeah, and and um, you know this comes from Seattle, and um, Han Seng is my friend, and. Um, uh, uh, the company and but but I just want to talk about the principle um so what he's doing is he's infusing uh light um in into well first of all little droplets of water so what do little droplets of water consist of well we found and this is in the, the fourth phase book that you and that you mentioned um which by the way has become really popular and <laughs> it's translated now into about 10 languages awesome. um but yeah, it, I'm 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 pleased. Um, uh, um, 
yeah, it's mainly because of my son's artwork, not any particular gift on my part, but whatever. So, so what's a droplet? And I, I treat that in, in the book. And, and, and we found, based on experimental evidence, that a, a droplet, you know, a droplet is typically spherical or almost spherical, and what keeps it into this spherical uh, shape. And, and um, we found that it consists of easy layers. I, I, I mentioned uh, that the e- easy it was planar, but of course, a uh, plane can be wrapped around. And so we found that a droplet consists of multiple, the envelope is, it consists of multiple uh, sheet-like layers that exist. Um, uh, it's like onion skin. Um, or on, onion uh, layers. And then inside that is ordinary liquid water uh, inside a, a droplet with protons. And the protons are repelling each other. Therefore, they push out, but they push against this resistance of, of this easy layer. And because of the pushing out, it's like a balloon. And that's why it retains a spherical or almost spherical shape. So by putting light in, uh, the light is then uh, being absorbed by these easy layers, and uh, easy layers grow, and they have potential energy. And I, I, I think it might be um, that the efficacy of the device uh, it comes from the potential energy that that um, the, every droplet that you you every aerosol droplet that you breathe in contains energy. You get that energy. You get easy. Um, and, and, and therefore, um, you know, you're, you're feeling better. You're feeling um, healthier. I think that's the mechanism. Um, as far as I know, it's, it, it appears uniquely in that particular, um, uh, device. And, and I should say nothing else because I, I don't want to be <laughs> no, I, uh, haw- hawking any particular, but I, I, am, I respect, I respect that. Um, I want you to remain a trusted scientist and researcher. So I'm, I'm very pleased to support you and your, you know, non-biased opinion. Um, for those listening, I want to let you know, you can find the show notes for this episode at lukestory.com slash EZ water. I'm sure we've talked about a lot of historical references and things like the nano V that people are going to want to research. Um, so if, if light is affecting water in the ways in which you've discovered and we've described here today, uh, could conceivably one, uh, expose their water directly to red light without having, you know, the nano V, um, you know, cause what's going on inside the nano V, I, I don't know. Cause it's, you know, an enclosed really German made you know, metal machine. Uh, but it does have a setting where you can actually adjust the light that is the ambient light coming out of the little um, glass jar. And I have it set to red again because I don't want blue light at night. But I have from time to time experimented with my drinking water and shined a, you know, a red light on it for a period of time while it's going through the vortexer and things like that. And it's just kind of a fun experiment. And there's no way that I could ever prove that it's doing anything. But do you think it's conceivable that directly exposing one's drinking water to red light, almost giving that water red light therapy could have a positive effect or, or increase the likelihood or the, the amount of easy water present? It's possible, but um, on, it, needs to be, it needs to be tested. So if the water, for example, contains some minerals, uh, if the water is in a, a container that can nucleate the growth of easy, um, and any of those could you know, um, 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 could, could, could be the source of easy water. And once you have easy water, if you put light in, uh, especially infrared light, um, you're going to get a growth of easy water. So, so in theory, it might, it might work. And I should mention that in India, there's a, there's a woman who works in my laboratory, comes from India. And she told me about her grandfather who, um, followed the, tradition that's followed by a lot of people in India, where you put uh, water into a jug that's colored. And one is colored green, one is colored red. And I, I don't remember, maybe blue. I can't, I can't recall. And you put it in the sun. So it absorbs the sunlight. And depending on what your, what your issue is, uh, you know, whether it's the flu or pain in the, in the back or whatever, you drink from one or another of the, of those uh, jugs. So, so, you know, it's, it's in history, probably dating back to uh, Ayurvedic times, 5,000, 10,000 years ago. And we have a 
tendency, unfortunately, to discount any of those uh, traditions as being non-scientific. This is gradually <laughs> changing because you know, we've come to realize that there's a lot of wisdom with those ancients. You know, so it's possible. I, 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 the answer to your question, I don't know whether it does or it doesn't, but it's something that needs to be studied. Okay, good. Well, I'm hoping someone listening who's got a laboratory will get on this. Um, another thing that I've done periodically is, uh, to your point about the Ayurvedic practices in India, is put my water in a um, Myron glass vessel, which is kind of a purple glass. And I forget if it cuts out the UV or the infrared or what the case is, but it's widely known amongst hippie types like me, or at least believed by us, that you can structure the water by putting it out in the sun in that particular glass in particular. So that's interesting because I didn't know about the correlation to that historical reference. That's uh, that's interesting. Well, yeah, I mean, it's possible. And in, in certain cultures like the Korean uh, culture, the, there are certain crystals that are heated and you could sit... Um, uh, in a room surrounded by those uh, heated crystals, different different ones for different different issues, and uh, so it's sort of reminiscent of what what you're talking about. And yeah. you know, there may be a lot to it. I I only I only wish that um, more people would be would be studying this. And um, um, but it's really hard, and is it's hard to it's hard to get money uh, for studying this because it, I. I, I pointed, for example, to the um, NIH um, and being, uh, you know, the, the, it's, it's like there's a wall around the NIH where water can't <laughs> penetrate um, you know, or a lot of stuff can't penetrate. And, you know, we are, ourselves in our laboratory, we had been fortunate uh, to be funded. It's hard to get money from the government to do this, but a private funder came across our work and for now, I think seven or eight years, has been very generously funding us. Unfortunately, uh, he ran into a, some financial difficulty and he's had to withdraw. So our, our operation is now um, zero funding. And it, it, unless we're able to, you know, to, to find um, some replacement funding, um, it would represent a, a closure of our laboratory and all that we're doing. Oh man, dude, we can't let uh, that happen. No, well, I mean, if you, the, if any of your listeners, um, you know, are interested in this stuff, please, I'm easily reachable, um, 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 from the internet or whatever, ghp at uw.edu. Uh, it's very easy. And, we would appreciate anything because um, it could be imminent disaster. And um, yeah, so. Well, I'm hoping that out of the 10,000s of people that are going to eventually hear this in the coming months, that um, someone will be motivated to support you guys. And and as I said, we'll put all of the links to everything discussed, including your upcoming event, because this will have published by that time, uh, as well as the link that you just mentioned that was hard for me to remember already. We'll put all of those links at lukestory.com slash easy water. Uh, I've got one more technical question for you and then I'll, I'll let you off the hook here. And I appreciate your generosity of time. It's a long time to sit in front of a computer for all of us. Um, I'm curious about uh, metabolic water or deuterium depleted water that your body manufactures, if I'm not mistaken, within the mitochondria. Is that synonymous with exclusion zone water or are we talking about two different things? I, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, uh, it could be, but it needs to be studied. It's, it's possible. I know, um, there is a abundant evidence that if you, um, if you drink deuterium depleted water, um, it's good for health. I've, I've seen, uh, studies and, you know, it seems that the studies are reliable. I've heard it from uh, different quarters and, um, my hypothesis uh, is, is pure speculation because we've done nothing. It, it could be, you know, since easy water um, is like a crystal and crystals are built of the same entities which repeat again and again and again. And so you, if you um, have a, a different entity, um, like for example, um, uh, uh, a water that contains some deuterium, uh, uh, molecules, they may not fit in the lattice as, as well. And therefore the buildup of easy water 
in the face of those deuterium um, molecules may not be able to build as readily as if you remove them, then you have a pure crystal, the pure crystal can grow better. So this is a pure speculation and I have no evidence to support that, but that's where if, if we began studying it and we actually initiated some studies, but um, so, so far um, they haven't progressed um, very far. That would be my speculation. Okay, that's that's interesting. Yeah, over the past few years, I have done a few rounds where I've exclusively uh, used deuterium depleted water, anywhere from uh, ten to ninety five parts per million, which is much lower than any water you'd find in nature typically. Uh, and interestingly, aside from just anecdotally feeling more energy, just to state it basically. I have tested my deuterium levels periodically throughout. And each time I have done a cycle of that water for two or three months, my levels have gone down dramatically in a way that they would never be able to just live in my life. (laughs) So I think that's, that's very interesting. And the, the, I've interviewed a number of experts who focus on the deuterium depletion thing. And I think one of the interesting things about it that might meet your speculation is that when this heavy hydrogen um, deuterium gets in the nanomotors of the mitochondria, it essentially gums them up and slows them down and makes it more difficult for them to produce ATP, which kind of goes along with that, uh, what, what you just stated about the crystalline structure of the water being able to then make the easy water within your body. That's, that's really interesting. Well, I mean, it's, it's one speculation. There, there yeah. may be others, but I was, I- I respect that. I mean, I'm just putting the pieces together and going, oh, interesting. Oh, uh, you're one- great at putting the pieces together. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. One, one, I'm an armchair scientist here. I mean, what I'm looking for for myself and, and also the audience is just any and every way that one can expand not only their vitality physically, but ultimately really their consciousness, our consciousness. You know, the more we can get in touch with our curiosity and our passion and intuition and those things that keep life interesting and mystical. That's what this show is all about. And you've done a, um, a great service to us bringing your body of knowledge. So I thank you for coming on the show today. Uh, oh, it's and, my pleasure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I could geek out on this stuff forever, as you may have guessed at the two hour mark. I do have one final question, which I ask all of our guests, except the one time I forgot. Uh, you've taught us so much here today. Um, so I want to ask you uh, three influences in your life, three teachers or teachings that have really impacted your worldview or your scientific endeavors that you might share with us. The first one was the Japanese guy who I um, I mentioned, um, who taught me, who taught me that uh, <laughs> theories put forth even by distinguished, the most distinguished of all people, could be flat flat out wrong. Uh, that's the first really important one. Um, the second was um, meeting um, Gilbert Ling. Uh, I, I, I talked about him and demonstrating to me that uh, there was something different about water. And the, the last one is maybe my great scientific hero. Um, and that is Albert St. Georgi. And um, a lot of people don't know him. He's considered to be Hungarian scientist, the father of modern biochemistry. He won the Nobel Prize, uh, of course, um, um, for his studies, his dis- discovery of vitamin C. Um, but he was more than that. He was, he was a, a scientist's scientist, and he knew so many things uh, about creativity and uh, approaching a science in the way in the way that um, could reveal really genuinely uh, new concepts. And he's famous for various aphorisms, uh, uh, you know, one-liners that, so for example, my, among my favorites, um, um, life, he knew about structured water. Um, he said, life is water dancing to the tune of solids. <laughs> That's wow. one that I like, wow. popular. That's the one great. I like, the one I like the best is discovery. He said, discovery is seeing what everybody else has seen, but thinking what nobody else has thought. Wow. That's that amazing. Precious? I love that. Yeah. So, so, love that. so those, those you might say are the, the three people who influenced me um, 
maybe the most. Uh, with more time, I might think of some more, but you asked for three. Oh, that's and good. You- three, three is good, man. That's adequate. Well, thank you so much again for your time today. It's been really fun to finally get to meet the man behind this incredible book and, and your body of knowledge. So I, I very much appreciate you joining us today. And we're going to, as I said, put in the show notes, you know, links to your lab and organization and your event. And, you know, I encourage everyone listening to, to get on board and to help you further your research because it's really important. Well, thank you. I, I, I really much appreciate that. It yeah. feels important to me too. And I, I w- w- would like to be able to continue. Well, man, if you're still this passionate at 82, you must be onto something. We can't stop now. <laughs> if you're, not, if you're not ready to stop, then we should find a way to help you. No, continue I'm not work. ready to stop. <laughs> no. Right on. Okay. Luke, right on. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Take care.